Anyways, coming up next, when he gets back to the room, oh, he's there, sorry, <laughs> is uh, Irish Masms with Digital Forensics is not just for incident response anymore. Neck is broken. Hey, there we go. Let's start this again. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for attending. First off, the disclaimer. I speak for nobody. Nobody speaks for me. This has not been based on any previous work that I might have done for any other previous employer or customer. Get my drift? Thank you. Please don't sue me. Who am I? I, I apologize profusely at this point. I will drop some F-bombs at some point in my talk. I apologize if that offends you. So, we get to talk about digital forensics today. In the last couple of roles, especially the previous place I was working at, even my current one, we all talked about, are all familiar with doing digital forensics for incident response. What's the malware? What's it looking like? Got to go put the fire out, et cetera. But there's other ways, other things that we should be looking at from a risk perspective for the companies that we work with, that work for, to help them assess and give them the story, let the data tell the story, as it were, for what's happening and what's going on. So we're going to talk about what does that really mean. We're going to talk about uh, some of the examples that we've had that might be real world. How much it's going to cost to set up a forensics program? What should you look at if you're looking to outsource or get someone to help you do digital forensics? And also some things to look for if you're looking personally to do digital forensics, get to learn more about this particular area of our field. So first, let's set some ground truth here and what are we talking about? Because there's two things that tend to overlap in sub-organizations in regards to e-discovery and digital forensics. In short, they're both the same, but e-discovery is legally obligated digital forensics. You just got the summons, you just got the notice of the discovery, and you have to produce all this information. The premise, the procedures, how you do things is all the same. It's just you're being told that you have to do it and you have to provide it in a very sound manner, otherwise opposing counsel is going to be all over you. So that digital data, the things you're asking for, the things you're doing, are scarred in a mentality here of how do you go about this. First off, we have to seize that data, seize those devices, with a particular chain of custody and documented so that if we do have to go to court, if we do have to go in, in front of law enforcement, we have that chain of custody, it has not been contaminated with, it's logically and legally sound. Then when we have those devices, we have that storage media, now we can collect it using that same process of procedures that we've established, copy, making a working copy, making what I would call the mother copy of that data for us to do analysis on using that special hardware and data and tools, then doing the analysis. What is that data telling us? Letting it tell the story. And then that story, we document in a nice PDF report to be able to give that to our counsel, our opposing counsel, the leadership, HR, wherever the case may be. To say, this is what we've happened, this is what we see in this data and with some of those reports, we might actually add in there, hey, to prevent this from happening again, here's our recommendations. So what can these be useful? A lot of the internal th cases that I've worked with or had friends of mine worked with in prior lives, fraud investigations, preservation of that data, 
in, we have somebody leave the organization, but they're at a certain key role or level, so they're like, let's make a digital copy of their things just in case something happens. Or that data, that device died, we're trying to get the data off of it. Then to the legal side, you have the discovery litigation support because we're actually getting sued. You have folks walking out the door, starting other companies, so you have intellectual property theft or leakage issues. And then also drive wiping or wipe verification certification for that we don't want this data to go anywhere, but we want to reuse this equipment, this storage devices. So certainly any organization that has intellectual property might find this useful. Organizations that have identi identifying information about individuals, PII, PHI, HIPAA, all the uh, acronym words you want to throw out there, this tends to come into play a lot. Certainly if you're in an environment where there's potential litigation because employees are not doing what they should be or doing things they really shouldn't be, theft, fraud, harassment, breach of contract, that sort of thing. This is where you can put the data together to provide that to leadership to go, here's what the data says, here's what you should probably be doing to manage risk for our organization. So in those infrastructure sectors, you know, law firms, retail, healthcare, if you're in an organization that you're being targeted by nation state actors or crime syndicates, this definitely comes into play. A lot of the individuals that I've worked with in prior lives uh, providing this sort of support, they're the ones you typically think of in regards to head of IT, head of security, um, HR department, the ethical officer, the ethical committee of an organization, these are the folks that are trying to figure out what is this data, how do we figure it out, and how do we figure out how much trouble we're in, right? So. Let's kind of go through some of these real world examples that either I've uh, found, that I've referenced, or friends of myself have worked on over the years, okay? So within HR issues, you have the email, you have instant message, you have all those things of the basic communication channels that people have that sense of, um, you can't track me back, right? That uh, you don't know who I am, well, that's not quite true, right? Intellectual property theft, a lot of that deals with, hey, getting that sort of thing of the data in where was it, where should it have been, and how did it leak out, and where are they using it for their own gain versus the organization that actually owns it? We already even, everybody usually is familiar with, you know, having an incident response or security breach and trying to figure out what that malware does and where it goes. You have the particular aspects and within legal matters. And also confirming when you're dealing with that, that you're doing the proper preservation methods are in place to avoid sanctions. So that was one of the big things in the Apple versus Samsung court case a few years ago. Samsung didn't check the little box to save email past 90 days. So when, even though they got the notice of discovery, they didn't bother to check that box, they got sanctioned once they had to report back to the court. Then there's that white verification certification. This is that uh, ability of, hey, we want to use this laptop or we want to donate this equipment to a school or give it to a different part of the company that shouldn't have access to that data that was stored on there. So let's wipe it, let's get a white verification so we're legally blessed that that data has been destroyed. So specifically in regards to forensics and legal cases, right? We're documenting that investigation, we're documenting the evidence, so we can provide those critical details for that litigation that's involved. Now if you're gonna use a third party, which we'll dig into a bit later, now you have a subject matter expert that's probably been a, an expert witness in court before that can just talk about that process, what you did and what they found. So let's talk about a real world example. I like to call this the hold my beer and watch this. So individual is out ATVing, lo and behold, did something stupid and hurt himself pretty bad. So they tried to claim a manufacturer's default. 
they brought in an expert witness who tried, agreed with the plaintiff. During the deposition, the counsel asked, hey, are all the pictures, are all the images involved with this case in this report? And the expert witness paused. And they're like, what? Well, no, there was some others, but they didn't get in the report because they're on some failed hard drives. Okay, stop the deposition right there. Let's subpoena the hard drives, let's get them. Bring in the digital forensics expert to take images of those hard drives that had failed, air quotes. And they found 32 additional photos on those failed hard drives. Nine of those were critical to the case. The judge gave an adverse and furious instruction and the guy lost the case. Um, this is Johnson versus uh, American Honda. American Honda was actually a couple weeks away from settling with this guy. And all it took was opposing counsel in the deposition catching the guy hesitate and going down that rabbit hole, right? Down to letting the data tell the story, if you have those data sources. So similar in regards to human resources sort of cases of that interactions of people in that organization and how stupid we can get, right? The real intent in this is trying to remove that prejudice and limiting the legal action towards your organization. So let's talk about this case where there was an administration assistant for a C-level reported sexual harassment to HR. So we get pulled in, we do the forensic imaging of the cell phones to collaborate the claims to what's going on. What we found out in this analysis was that the admin assistant had been texting this specific C-level, but the C-level did not initiate, did not respond. Matter of fact, that C-level responded, told her um, to cease communications. I don't, this is, no, I don't want to do this. In our investigation, we also found out that this C-level was actually having an affair with a different admin assistant in the organization. The harassment claim was filed a day after the initial admin assistant found out that he was in the affair. We also, through this analysis, realized that that admin assistant was a former adult film star and had probably also been moonlighting during this time. So, it was an interesting brief out, to say the least, of this case. This is that sort of thing where if you just had a regular HR taking people on their word, how much risk is this company incurring by not documenting what the communications were, what really happened, and having it in a report so when they have to walk people out the door or if legal uh, action was put down, hey, here's the report, here's the actual communications. You're basically covering yourselves, okay? Another one that tends to uh, provide some interesting stories along the way is uh, intellectual property theft. It's amazing how many people think they can get away with this. Well, I'm just gonna collect all this information while I'm working in X company, and then I'm gonna go start my own, and they'll never realize or know. <laughs> So, wouldn't you know, here's some executives that let the left the company and started their own competing business. The original company suspects some IP theft was taken, so they bring in some forensic analysts to get the laptops from both old and new company, and lo and behold, it was wiped with a specific data wiping tool. So reporting that to the court that the same tool was used on both laptops, basically the lack of evidence is actually evidence because it was the same tool and they were able to, to, to prove that to the court. So the white verification piece, that's, hey, we want to destroy this. We don't want it to get out. This, um, there are certain organizations that have certain uh, 
requirements that they have to certify that that data has been destroyed. So you wipe it, you do an imaging, you make sure that data is destroyed. There's nothing that you can recover. Also keep in mind that there are some data destruction tools that don't necessarily work as well as they're advertised. What a concept. So as an example, there's a few out there if you go looking out on the internet where, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm bored, I'm gonna go buy hard drives from eBay and see what we find. So in this one, in particular one, they found the launch procedures for THAAD, the uh, Terminal High Altitude Area Defense Ground Air Missile System. They found medical records, uh, network data and security logs for the German Embassy in Paris. Um, in doing examples like this, I know we've seen um, tax paperwork for individuals, uh, compromising photos, you name it, it's there. When people throw stuff away, they just really don't think of the actual information that's on those drives. So when we're talking about incident response, you know, the key pieces with that is, do we have all the IOCs? Do we know and can we have an understanding of what these adversaries are doing within our environment? environment? Where'd they go lateral movement? What file system changes we make, made? What did they exfil, if not? How far did they get so we can figure out how do we want to put the mitigation plan together and at what time so we can kill it all in one fell swoop, right? And you can just randomly pick <laughs> out there on the internet what sort of forensic and incident response capability incidents that have been out there are used for. This is one in particular that you know, that company was actually doing a POC with a security tool and oh, lo and behold, they had been compromised for ages. So, let's talk about the capabilities, right? We've talked about the different scenarios and why we'd want that data, why we'd want that in a nice report to give that to the C-levels or give that to HR, opposing counsel, et cetera. So how, what things do we need? Because there is, Everything out there today is collecting data on us or we're storing data on it. There has been subpoenas for Fitbits in court cases. They're trying to figure out how to pull data and do, do uh, subpoenas to um, the Alexis and other things because it's collecting that information. You name it, if it's got data on it, it's probably been involved in some court case already to source on media accounts, cloud storage, web pages, web mail, to the plethora of laptops and phones that are out there. With the majority of operating systems you can think of. So when you're building a forensics program, you need to think about and get a good idea of what devices you have in your environment, because you're gonna need to know what adapters you're going to need. Oh, well if I have an iPad that has a cell card in it, then you're probably gonna want some Faraday bag or Faraday cage to put it in. What sort of operating systems are you gonna to need to use to be able to get imaging off of, to be able to troubleshoot, to have, oh, there's this one particular server that still has SCSI 3 drives in it. We need to pull an image off of it. Uh -huh. Have fun getting those adapters in a short time frame. So the typical vendors for forensic tool sets run the gambit with uh, Encase, who actually is headquartered here in Pasadena. Nuix, Black Bag, Oxygen, uh, FDK, Celebrate, Magnet, all some really decent tools out there if you can afford them. And if you have the case load, case flow that would call for affording those tool sets. There is a good handful of open source tools uh, the SIFT, uh, SoothKit and Autopsy, DEF, there's even some native tools and enhancements. You know, everyone talks about DD for wiping. Uh, there's also the DCFL DD, which although is no longer supported, it is a really good tool, I still use it. So, in beyond that software for doing the imaging and doing the analysis, you also need to have some sort of safe for storage in the media and devices, because back to that chain of custody, you have to prove that nobody else has messed with that image, that with, messed with those drives, right? You're gonna need some sort of workbench and tool. You're gonna need a, our inventory of those hard drives you're taking images of and also putting them onto for what you're working with. You need some sort of write blockers so that 
that source drive to make your mother copy isn't contaminated or messed with, it's pure, the disk imager, and then also for that room you're doing it in, you also need to consider the physical security aspects. Again, you need to be able to prove to the court, to the judge, to law enforcement, that no one's been able to mess with your lab, with your environment, with the, that safe and with those drives. So, just a ballpark in regards to costs, you're looking at around 26 to 30K. Get a couple workbenches, the machine, the safe, the software, et cetera. It, it adds up quickly, so it's taking that business call of, do we have that many forensic cases that we're gonna wanna do, or do we wanna outsource this? And we'll talk about that in a little bit. There's also that additional cost, right? There's that construction for the room if you don't have one already, or at least making some modifications to a room you already have. Do you have the right networking and the right cabling for that room? And is it segmented off from your other network pieces? You're gonna want this on its own, right? Do you have any privacy screens or window frosting for looking into that room? Because if you're working on something such as uh, CP, you don't want uh, coworkers seeing that. That just creates another HR problem for you, right? There's the other furniture for cabinets and shelving and things to store your parts and whatnot. A Faraday bag, which I mentioned earlier. There's that always something new. There's always some new software to look at in regards to can I get the, that data off and can I do some analysis for it, right? Some of the tools for um, looking at those traditional forensic images aren't necessarily the same tools that you're going to use to pull uh, from your social media, from your cloud-based email, that sort of thing. That's going to take something separate. It's not going to be the same tools that you're going to want to use for taking and doing analysis on phones versus hard drives from a laptop. Storage of all those case notes, of all those reports, a storage of, of images, you're, not, you're going to want to put that on some sort of central NAS, SAN, some place to safeguard with that. And then some sort of case incident tracking system to know what you're working on, what the status is. As well as some headcount and overhead and funding for maturing that individual or those individuals in forensics. This is a whole other separate area. There's a whole different track of other conferences and things that we don't usually get involved with. It's its own little enclave in there, right? Finding talent and hiring is very interesting. Actually, sometimes it's a much harder. Yes, you can find some prior law enforcement or folks that worked in the FBI labs. Unfortunately, with those, they tend to be very focused in one particular area, right? Here's the guy from the FBI lab, and all he's done or she has done is mobile phone analysis for the last five years but ask them about anything else and they didn't get involved with it. So it's very stovepiped, which may work for your company and your environment, it might not. There's also the folks that do e-discovery, which is that subset or you know, aspect of digital forensics that they also have some great experience, but trying to get into the full-fledged forensics, for lack of a better uh, phrase, they find a hard time doing. So don't dismiss them right off the bat if you're trying to hire. So if you're starting out self-learning this, right, the Practical Forensic Imaging by Bruce Nickel, I'd say that's probably the first book to read. Really great book. So yes, there is the formal schooling in colleges out there. There's the technical training and certifications, the vendor neutral, and then also vendor focused. And then there's also law enforcement focused certifications that you have to be a Leo to be able to attend. In short, with a lot of these, uh, with the certification stuff, hopefully your com employer can pay for them. I'd have a hard time recommending somebody on their own trying to go through it all. There's some great online resources that are out there. The Forensics Wiki and Forensics Focus. There's also some invite-based uh, Discord and Slack communities specifically about digital forensics. Some tend to be uh, Leo focused, ten some tend to be more InfoSec or uh, eDiscovery focused. It all really depends on who's the individuals in that community. And mentioned about the different conferences, that's its own little community, if you will. Yes, you'll have some overlay with the SANS, um, but some of the other stuff, uh, it's its own thing. It's really interesting to see. So let's talk about some gotchas. Some pain points I've might, or friends I might have felt over 
the last number of years in doing forensics. First, there is the powered versus unpowered USB ports and write blockers. There's only certain USB devices you can put on an unpowered that's going to work to be able to pull it off of. So if you have, let's say, an external hard drive, Western Digital, and you put it on an unpowered write blocker, it's not going to work. It's not giving it enough power. So you've got to figure out how to do that with the right write blockers, giving it enough power to be able to get the image off of. You have the fun of OS X encryption and trying to figure out how to do that, especially with the newer lap laptops, newer systems, newer versions of iOS. Um, the USB variants, they're getting bad at SCSI and trying to get the right adapters and right connectors you need for it. Having the right field kit for where you know you're going to have when you respond on site to a client, right? So you say that, you get that phone call, hey, can you come out on Monday? We have a laptop and phone. Okay, cool. Always have to assume the worst. Do not assume those are the only two devices because when you show up, it's actually three different phones, two different laptops, two iPads, and the initial laptop they were talking about. Like, oh, well, we found these over the weekend. So now you're trying to figure out where is the fries or micro center close to you to go buy some of the things that you think you need without having to drive across LA in rush hour traffic to get those things from your lap. Not that I had to deal with that. Some of the other things from a program standpoint, some of these software tools, you can only buy through a value-added reseller. You cannot buy them direct. So now you have to deal with salespeople. And we'll leave it at that. There's also renewal costs because you don't buy that software outright. You're basically buying a license for a year. So again, you make sure you got a budget for these sort of things. You also have to make sure that you're showing use of these things to upper management, because then it'll be like, well, you don't need oxygen anymore. We're killing that. There's also the aspect of hardware purchases, or do you build yourself? A lot of people are familiar with digital attendance, DI, and that stack tower called Fred that caught, just pay through the nose for, which is great. It has everything in it. I've used forensic computers for many years from the systems they build. They work great for me. Uh, Silicon Forensics is another one. You know, basically, that hardware needs are based on those tool sets you're using and those software package requirements. No need to overbuild or overbuy on your forensic workstation, unless you want to. Feel free. Um, yeah, ticketing and incident management systems. So make sure you have the right role-based access controls because you don't need folks from IT digging through your forensics cases, especially when they double click on the malware. So on the horizon, IoT and network devices and the other things that are getting thrown on the network or getting thrown in the air that is now collecting data, that is now involved in some sort of litigation or involved in some sort of HR issue. Or, for example, um, physical break-in into an office and the criminals knew exactly where to go to turn off the camera system. So I'm asking the building management, can I get the cameras to take forensics off of the cameras? And they looked at me like I was insane. Well, the criminals had deleted all their recordings. What can I get off of it? Got to ask the question, right? Can we at least get the, story, get the data to tell the story? So in these UAVs and pulling data off of, here's all the little data points that might be useful in a forensics case. It, it's crazy what they're collecting and what you can get off of it, what they're, what they're collecting and what you can get off of it. So that's a big chunk of money. That is a lot of effort that a lot of organizations I don't think would be prudent for them to build themselves and try to build it internally. So what do we do about outsourcing this? What do we do about getting a third party, right? Because that's that risk deferment, that's that liability transfer. That is the, oh, so we had this woman who filed an HR complaint for sexual harassment, so we called in a third party forensics company to do this work for us. That way our hands are washed of it there's no bias, there's no us messing with it, it's the data, right? 
They also can provide expert witness testimony because they have folks that do this on a regular basis. That's the only thing they do. And you know, it could be completely outsourced or it could be just to augment your internal capabilities. I know plenty of companies that have their own forensics team, but they have a retainer with forensics company outside for those overflows or for those particular cases that just like, we don't want to handle this. Or we do want to handle it, but it'd be more prudent and less risky for us to hand it up. So you're looking at, you know, you don't need the forensics lab, the trained staff completely and to individuals to perform those investigations, basically you can hire, bring in that hired gun or guns to be able to do it for you. So if you did outsource it, it the prices are gonna vary. Depends on your need, how, how soon, how urgent you want it, and the complexity of it. So here's some ballpark prices for a forensic investigation of a laptop, smartphone, and the malware investigation with RE, depending on where you're at. And it, when you get those sort of pricing, it breaks it down in just getting forensics imaging of a device, which is usually by terabyte, the whole entire case, whether it's a mobile or a laptop, um, whether you want the remote email collection. So it's broken down, so it's, it shouldn't be for getting the right vendor, right person to help, company to help you with this stuff, shouldn't be just a, a lump sum for you. There should be some play in this sort of stuff. So those typical offerings are usually probably by statement of work with time and materials. Hey, do this stuff, it's gonna cost me X amount. It could be per case, and it could also be via retainer. Like, like hey, we are gonna have X, let's say 10 cases a year. It's certainly a lot easier for you to get that retainer in place with a person to call and an email to go, hey, John, can you show up on Monday? We have a case for you. Versus the run around trying to get all the paperwork and the purchase order and everything else done before they even show up. Some of those might require an upfront payment. Some organizations are more than willing to do a zero dollar to be able to invoice against it. So you have all the paperwork in place but you can call them immediately when you need to, all right? So, in those providers within the Orange and LA counties, they run the gambit of just the one-man operation, I'm in my ba mother's basement, okay, maybe at least their garage, okay. They're doing the support for the attorneys and the DAs and multiple law firms in the area. Now, they might be local, they might travel the world, might just travel the United States. Then you also have the larger companies that have offices around the United States and you get the local f office to help you with it. Their rates are around the 285, 295, 300 aspect, okay? There's also the Digital Forensics Corp in San Diego, which when we were doing this market basket comparison, we found this company and could not find anything about them. We would make phone calls and it just goes to a general voice system with no extensions, no voicemail. It's just like a complete black hole. Um, apparently there's some DOD contractors. We'll just leave it at that. So in looking at all the providers, you have everything down from 200 an hour up to 425 an hour in regards in the, for Southern California doing this kind of work. So what you need to look at is Do they have the ability to scale? Can they, do they have those certifications? Do they have special pricing that's tied to your cyber insurance policy? Are they certified? When I say certified with air quotes, that certification by the insurance company is basically senior level executives that went to go play golf somewhere and said, hey, can you guys give us a deal on the forensics if you put us on, our, on the preferred list? Sure, not a problem, let me buy you another beer. Totally serious. It's all business. Can that provider handle the equipment in your environment, like we talked about earlier? What things do you have in your environment you might need to pull forensics on, you might need to do analysis with? Get some example reports of theirs. Give them a softball or an easy case to do, and do you like it? Did you get the answers back that you want to hear? Have they been an expert witness before? And what sort of cases? What was the details? Were they successful? Are they registered and do they have experience in that court? And we'll touch on that in a minute too. 
So with digital forensics, it's supposed to be, should be, a simultaneous engagement capability. This is not a single consultant doing this one project for a number of days. They should be able to be taking in an image while they're doing analysis on a different project. If they can't, you might want to find a different provider. So what's that depth and breadth of that final report? What's that feedback? What's the expert opinions are they providing or not? Or are they just giving you the dump from Nuix or the forensics tool set going, here's your report. And like, I could have done that. Why did, you, why did we pay this guy this money? What's their turnaround time? What's their response time? How tech, what's their technical acumen in their be able to explain how they did things? So let's talk about expert witness because not many of us in the InfoSec side of the house are familiar with this. Basically, sanctioned, identified by the court that they are an expert in this particular topic that they're going to speak to in the court of law. Now, some are registered, some are not. Some bar associations have registration, but you have to pay to be on them. Isn't that a nice game? So, LA County has an expert witness list. So you send them a nice letter and your resume documenting how you are an expert in this field. And about two months later, you'll get a rejection letter back. Um, San Diego, Orange, and Riverside counties have no such list. Then it's talking with the individual bar associations and law firms to see what they have and what they know. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about this already of, hey, what do I need? What does, my, what does our organization need for determining what forensic needs we have? How do we scope this program? And should we build it internally? Should we get an outsource? What, what's that look like? So currently, certainly, is what are you doing now? And certainly, nothing is an answer there, right? Do you have anybody on retainer? The number of organizations I've talked with that IT and InfoSec says, yeah, no, we don't have anybody. And then we had a conversation with legal team. They're like, oh, yeah, we have this company that does forensics and e-discovery. We've been using them for five years. And InfoSec didn't even know. If you had an HR investigation, how does that process work? How does the head of HR reach out to InfoSec or forensics or legal and go, hey, we have this ish situation. We want to do some forensics. Or do they even know that this is a potential option when dealing with that sort of situation? What's your policies look like? Do you have BYOD? Do you have corporate data on personal laptops, phones that can be downloaded to or from? What's your guest network look like? If a lawsuit was brought against your organization, are you equipped and skilled enough to handle that e-discovery process? What's your assessment of the reliability of performing your own internal investigation? Or should you have an expert to call in when it hits the fan? Do you have the compliance acronyms that you have to worry about? What's your compliance officer say? Can you do the mobile devices? Can you pull stuff from cloud, from Office 365, from Gmail, et cetera, in a sound following the chain of custody process? That's the key piece. Can you put the things on the legal hold? Samsung, apparently not. What's the email environment? What's your current security setup? What's those sort of things that might get in the way of taking a forensic image or force you to jump through some extra hoops to do it? So, there's a whole lot of buzzword bingo and marketing in this. Not so, not so much as some of the area, other areas in InfoSec, but what, what keys me in is those bi the billboards that up in Silicon Valley a couple years, that pretty much a couple years ago that said, you have been breached, you need our product. That their headquarters was here in Pasadena. Look at what things you need to do to have this capability 
that reflects what your needs are for this, right? Is it do it internal? Is it have somebody on call, on hand, on paper externally? Most likely probably some combination of both from most of the organizations I've worked with. What's this overlap in regards to digital forensics and security operations and e-discovery programs and how you're trying to mature that and what direction you're trying to head? Certainly, get a relationship from a trusted provider before you need one. Get that retainer, that paperwork in place before you need one. Trying to get your law uh, legal team and your purchasing folks to jump through hoops on a Friday night at 7 o'clock, not going to help you in your incident response process. Ensure that you have those basics. Invest in those capabilities rather than the tool sets. Because an analyst going to that SANS forensics class is probably going to give you a lot more bang for your buck than that tall Fred forensic server. Just a hunch. And also, is it good enough? Or are we still trying to strive for that perfect solution? Because there isn't, especially in forensics. So, some references and resources. I'll mention Bruce Nichols' book again. There's the Carnegie Mellon University CERT Handbook, the Forensic Examination of Digital Evidence, and then the Associated Police Chief Officers has a good practice guide for digital and evidence. Those law enforcement books are really good, especially for folks that haven't really done security, haven't done forensics, because they're written in a such a way that any Leo can walk in the door, read this book, and at least have some understanding about chain and custody and how to do things. So, some thanks, friends, my friend uh, JB, um, and also my friend Curiosity, may he rest in peace. Forensics Wiki and the Forensics Control folks, Enza Sands first, and then also all the folks that uh, do these stupid things at work that gives us work to do to dig through their data and just start laughing uncontrollably at times. Thank you very much. Appreciate you coming on the last talk. Any questions? Sir? For people that want to practice their forensic skill, or you were talking about kind of having rookies go through basic, where would you suggest to get tested for that? Okay, so for individuals that are looking to get into this, that are looking to practice this, okay? One, you can get media to take forensic images of all over the place. Goodwill is amazing. Flea markets. Um, if you're here in the Bay, or excuse me, if you're here in the LA area, there is the TRW swap meet. Uh, was it the third Saturday or fourth Saturday of every month? Um, there's last Saturday? Okay, thanks. Um, if you're up in the Bay Area, there's an electronics flea market from March through September on the second Saturday of every month. And it's amazing what things you find. So then from there, take those open source tool sets, which helps instill that same chain of custody, that same analytical process, as well as some of those commercial tool sets have free versions that will let you do a little bit, but not the full gambit. So at least you're familiar with that part. Um, also, I've had friends and folks that I know in the industry that they started out just doing data recovery. Hey, John, my, my hard drive just crapped out. Can you get the data off of it? You're going to do the same sort of processing, the same controls, help you walk through that process to recover the, you know, pictures of the grandkids for grandma. You're welcome. Any other questions? Sir. Fair. Yes. How many of us have a spare hard drive that's been laying around for years that we've probably forgotten what's on it at home? <laughs> we might not want to know what's on it, but that's what the white verification piece is for, right? <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Well, hey, thank you very much for your time. Hopefully you had a great conference. Uh, I'll be out in the hallway if you have anything uh, in particular you want to ask me not on tape. Thank you very much. Thank you to the internets. Have a good day. <laughs>